Our next speaker before the break is Mr. Lynn Singer. Mr. Singer is an assistant professor at the Institute of Design, Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago. Mr. Singer has taught at the University of Wisconsin, University of Illinois, Leighton Art School in Milwaukee, and the Bet Salal Academy of Art in Jerusalem, Israel. In addition, he is a research designer in Chicago and has been associated with various companies as an industrial designer. Mr. Singer will talk on the subject, the evolution, nature, and meaning of disposable products. Mr. Len Zinger. I've never, I've never done this before, so if you can bear with me while I struggle. I hope. I'm, I'm, I'm captive. I've come here to, to talk to you uh, about a subject that I've been concerned with for uh, at least five years or more. Could I have the slide? Which one is it? First one? Wait. Oh, what's going on? The other one. One before that. Okay, now what do I do? Push forward? On the, the right one, forward. Okay. Uh, in 1970, I received a grant from the, from the National Endowment of, of the Arts to do a study on the influence of disposable products on our lives as well as the environment. Among my many conclusions, the relation of disposable products and leisure, and pro and leisure environments appeared significant for disposable products have come to play a key role, I believe, in the emergence of leisure environments. And incredible as it may seem in today's depressed economy, disposable products are still being produced and consumed in record numbers. In spite of the recession, we continue to depend upon the conveniences and sanitary advantages of disposable products. The truth is disposable products have become very much a part of the American way of life, whether we like it or not. And this, of course, includes our leisure way of life. Through the widespread use of disposable products in America, leisure time has been made increasingly available to more Americans each year. And that's the key word, time. And this was discussed earlier by another speaker, the concept of leisure and time. The leisure time, of course, promotes leisure activities that are made possible by convenience, convenience items, and these items are, are becoming increasingly disposable. Take away from the average housewife, for example, such disposables of paper towels, plates, cups, tissues, napkins, placemats, aprons, and now diapers, and it would increase our wash load by 50, by 50 wash loads per, per year, according to a study. The weekly laundry pile would increase by 30 linen napkins, 35 handkerchiefs, and several dozen kitchen and bathroom towels as well, or take away the option to eat out inexpensively at McDonald's, which is almost totally dependent upon a disposable food service system, and the family would be compelled to spend far more, to far more time in the kitchen. But just as the widespread use of disposables are an increasingly significant factor in the rise of leisure environments, they are now also a significant byproduct of that environment as well, for the concepts of both leisure and disposable products run parallel, if not supportive, courses. Now, in the short time, uh, time that's gone, in fact, that I have left this afternoon, whatever that is, I would like to first quickly review, and I have some 74 slides, so bear with me, some historical events and growth factors in the rather short evolution of disposables and then discuss what this may mean in terms of cultural and social implications and in particular if I have time of course the leisure environment. I 
actually uh, disposable products uh, can be broken down into into three subcategories of sanitary products, those that are used single use or unit, unit dose types of products such as Kleenex. Consumable products, which we won't talk too much about today, but this could be, in, this could be considered pencils and erasers and even ice cream cones and, and edible products, which, which uh, are something of the future. And expendable products, and our expendable products are, are those that we're increasingly coming in contact with, those that cost more to resurface than repair. This is an American phenomenon. Now, a more, a, more, a more practical classification would be divide the group into two main categories, as shown in this table. On the left, you have sanitary products which are single use only, which include food service, hygiene, sterile, sterile medical products. And food service are basically paper products. And on the right, you have expendable products, which are single or limited use, and that includes the entire field of packaging of food service that is plastic or aluminum, non-woven clothing, uh, shelter, shelter, temporary uh, structures, tents, travel products, and, and other miscellaneous. Where do all these disposables fit on a relative scale of product durability? Well, on a relative scale of product durability, we see that the, the hammer is, the most, is an example of a durable product. Semi-durable product is the Volkswagen, which has, which has uh, some components which can be interchanged and thrown out. Semi-disposable, uh, which includes the battery, the flashlight with the batteries which are disposable. Disposable which we're most familiar with is the, is, 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 is the tissue, the Kleenex tissue. Now, I've labeled this pseudo-disposable, I call that, and those are products that really are not disposable, but we're told to throw them away. And that's, that's, a, that's an interesting subject that I want to talk about a little bit later. And then the expendable product, which is just a result of our, of our mass, our, our ability to produce tremendous amounts of, of products to the extent that the price comes down and, and they, it costs more to, to renew than to resurface. Uh, here we see the, the, the range of lifespan of disposable. Uh, they can range from anywhere from a six second life of a, of a paper cup, a little girl drinking, to a Pentel pen, which is roughly six weeks or less about that. So a six months is an inflatable shelter. Uh, now let us br br uh, briefly review some historical events. Some of the important historical uh, highlights, and I'm going to try and run through this. In the not too, uh, not, in not too long time, it all started with the simple with the simple converted paper products made possible by the invention of the Fondrier uh, paper making machine in 1798, but wasn't made practical until about 100 years later when the price per pound dropped to two cents per pound for paper. Another important event in the evolution of disposables occurred in 1857 when Pasteur presented his theory on germ control, which brought about sanitation reforms throughout the nation. One effect was to outlaw and abolish the then common drinking cup on trains, something we can't imagine now in public places. And this is, uh, this is an article that appeared in the, in the survey on September 3rd, which, which relates to Wisconsin abolishing, one of the first states, Wisconsin abolishing the, the, the common drink, metal tin drinking cup that was the only cup available on trains at the time in 1910, which was followed by many other states, all of them, yeah, very shortly. It was, soon, it was soon replaced with paper cups dispensed from water vending machine. And here's a, the, er, the first water vending machine that uh, uh, dispensed, that also dispensed paper cups. Uh, both, were, both were invented in 1908 and 1909. Here are some patent drawings of the very first, ver the first two-piece paper cup, which was patented in 1912. Believe me, this wasn't easy to find. 
It's very important products. Uh, 19, uh, in ni 1912, uh, another world-shaking event was a, was a conical cup invented by, uh, if he knew I was talking about him now, a guy by the name of Curtin. Uh, in 1916, uh, a very clever guy. Uh, here we have a much more familiar cup that we're all familiar with. We, we drink out of this every day, and we find that we can lift it very nicely without burning our hand, but as soon as we, as soon as we put it to our lips, we burn our lips. So that's a, that's a, that, that came out in the 1950s, uh, and it was developed by Crown Tool, uh, for Braniff Airlines. Uh, let's see. Okay, other other important dates to remember <laughs> in this in this fascinating history of disposable products. Uh, Eighteen thirty-nine. Uh, enter the tin can invented in England. Uh, soon to not too long after that, really, to have uh, ramifications, far-reaching ramifications. 1882, remember this, the first roll of bathroom tissue appeared. <laughs> Although it was produced in flat sheets since 1800, to be technically right, correct, for those that are watching me. Uh, 1894, paper boxes. 1895, paper napkins were first produced. All these, the <laughs> very insignificant product. 1896 paper bags, and in 1897, the first unit packaging was developed, <laughs> uh, which developed the Nabisco United Biscuit, which incidentally still appears in almost the original design that it was. The development of unit packaging, of course, was important because it gradually did away with this kind of merchandise in the Cracker Barrel stores as we see it, and gave rise to the modern supermarket. And this started in the late 1920s. Another important event was the invention of a spiral winding paper machine, uh, that is, to make paper. Uh, here you see it, the principle of it. it. was invented in 1902, really to make paper cans. And we remember uh, 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 cans of cleanser and the old Dutch cleanser can was the first application of, the, of that paper, uh, of pa a spiral winding machine. And after that, later, later came many spiral wound paper products, such as drinking straw, incidentally designed, uh, invented by a guy named Stone <laughs> around the turn of the century. And the elbow straw, or I'm sorry, the, the elbow straw, what we uh, use in hospitals today, Later in 1916, a process was developed to press paper, spoons, and plates. Uh, we don't see the spoons anymore, but we, we still use the plates. But it wasn't until 1923 when wooden spoons first appeared in Dixie ice cream cups. And not until 1938 did the, the deformed wooden spoon and fork appear. I, I'm not sure how many of you remember that here, because it, it's not around anymore. Still another important event in the history of disposables was the emergence of automatic vending machines. Here you see an automatic bar, yes, an automatic bar that, that dispensed liquor uh, in 1891. Uh, and a combination, the first combination gum and cigar vending, a sketch of it, uh, in 1900. Uh, they put these two together because that was the, the, the products that that, they, that was selling the most at the time at, on, on train station. This, this of course, cr uh, uh, created vast new markets for unit packaging, uh, automatic vending machines. During World War I, synthetic cotton was developed by Kimberly Clark for bandages and gas mask filters, and later used in 19, uh, uh, 1921 to make sanitary napkins. The beginning of disposables in the medical care uh, then can be traced uh, at that time to the first prepackaged sterile bandages by Johnson & Johnson in the late 1920s. And that's when they first started using in the hospitals. Before that time, bandages were, were handmade and medicines were, medicines were created 
mixtures were, of medicines were created in the hospital. There were no unit packaging. And that's, that's a fairly recent event. And just before World War II, the first disposable syringe was developed in 1938 by E.R. Squibb, and later in 1943, the hypomatic, which you see an automatic syringe here, uh, that's, a, that's a, a, unit, a unit dose for paratroop, paratroopers, was invented by Schering Corporation. And finally, in 1953, the first practical disposable needle set, syringe needle set, was developed by Shenley Labs, which we're all familiar with now. <laughs> Uh, if we go back a little bit, in, in, as far as packaging is concerned, it was as late as 1940 that finally the bug bomb and the, gave way to the to, to the aerosol can, which which peripherates the uh, the environment everywhere. It was invented to further revolutionize packaging. In 1942, polyethylene plastics was developed by the U.S. Navy. And this, this, this created a, 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 a next step of revolution in, in the evolution of packaging in 1948. The oleomargarine bag first appeared, and later blood bags, as we know them now, and, and strip pla plastic strip packaging in 1953, uh, which, which is very, very familiar, uh, before it's used and after it's used. The squeeze bottles, which we see all around, uh, laundry bottle, uh, bleach bottles in the alleys and things. Uh, 1955, polyethylene lined paper milk carton. Uh, very, very familiar everywhere, but it, 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 uh, it really didn't catch on around this area until, or it wasn't permitted by the, by the Board of Health in Chicago at least, until the early 19, or the middle 1950s. And finally, uh, space food pouches to rehydrate freeze-dried food, something that is a, is a recent, more recent technology. Uh, the impact of television in the home in the early 1950s gave rise to, the, to this, this delicious meal, this TV frozen dinner in disposable aluminum trays. This particular, the name of this was Frigid Dinner. I want you to remember that because it's such, it's such an important product. It was the brand first developed for airlines in 1950. Uh, it, it did have a great impact on our, our, our lives. Later, many other disposable products in aluminum were developed in many shapes, as you see, as, as is familiar now in, in, in supermarkets. Uh, in 1956, a non-woven disposable fabric uh, called K2000. It's like paper, but it's not because it's, the fibers are held together with, with, various, with various adhesives and, and resins. It was invented by Kimberly Clark. Uh, and here you see an example of, uh, well, here you see this a sketch uh, that's used for, for pillowcases and, and, and bedwear of, of all kinds, and, and mostly used in hospitals here in this country, and first used in hospitals. And here's uh, shoes, uh, overshoes for operating room that are made of uh, non-woven fabric, lab coats also. Other medical products, disposable products developed more recently include a a plastic baby nurser that, that, that looks like the mother's real thing and holds like it and all that. Uh, that's used in hospitals. It's a, it's a single unit, uh, single dose or single service unit that actually took a lot of, uh, a lot of design work and it's a very interesting product. We have a paper thermometer uh, that's throwaway after, after one use. Uh, it was almost developed three times, and it's, again, it's off the market. It just doesn't seem to read, read right. Those, those little round circles represent, would, should represent the, 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 uh, the reading uh, that's supposed to be uncovered uh, by the heat once it's in the mouth. Uh, it's never worked quite well enough to, to be put on the market. 
and there's a dissolvable laundry bag that, that turns into detergent, a very interesting product. <laughs> Uh, that's saving, that's, that's really ecologically responsible. Uh, and then we get into things like this that really, really aren't really disposable. You don't want to throw something away that, like a, like a, a drill. Uh, if you think about this uh, a little bit, the fact that we've, we've gotten to this point that we can afford this, that we can throw away products that have every, every implication of being permanent, that we, 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 we produce these things that can be thrown away. Still other more recent products include um, a toothbrush that has impregnated toothpaste and that is activated by saliva. Ingenious. Uh, a flashlight that, uh, again, shouldn't be thrown out, but uh, because it's its contents are consumable, they, the, all the rest of it has to go together with it. Uh, here's even a shopping cart that, uh, that you, you pick up, at, you buy, or you pick up at the, at the supermarket and take it home, and, and then I don't know what you do with it. Uh, how about these paper umbrellas? Now, this, is, this is considerably different than Japanese, uh, the old Japanese uh, uh, umbrella, uh, in in that it, it is disposable, and uh, it's 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 much less expensive, and they sell there's intended to sell at railroad stations, and I would have liked to have one today, because my feet are still wet. And how about furniture? This this has been around for a while, but it it's taking on uh, new meaning recently. Turning now to housing, uh, in 1946, when we get up to the scale of, of architecture, the idea for, for impermanence in architecture was implanted in the American mind with the development of prefabricated housing, which you know never caught on. So the Lustron house here is an example shown here. Although a few years before that, this paper house uh, was developed by the U.S. government for temporary use at a cost of, then of about $50, it weighed 1,000 uh, pounds. Later in the 1960s, paper tents appeared on the market for $4.95, uh, far more than $4.95, a, a folding disposable structure made of one and a half thick uh, uh, insulation panels that weighed 2,700 pounds. And finally, the ultimate Warren Chuck's proposed capsule unit tower of his plug-in city concept of 1964, which, which featured disposable living units. And incidentally, these living units, as you see, are all alike, unlike the, the other uh, uh, slides we saw this morning. Uh, let us turn to growth patterns, if, you, if I have a little more time here. Just to run through this, as you see, the age of disposables represents only one seven thousandth or one hundred thirty of the five hundred thousand years of object making on Earth. That's not very much, and uh, if you look around the environment, it, it, it really doesn't look like it. It was just here that, that recently. Since the age of disposables, however, their growth was indeed rapid. And what causes? Well, there's many factors that, that, that cause the, the rapid rise of disposables, uh, starting with urbanization and sanitation reforms and industrialization and everything, mass production, uh, manufacturing industries. You see in the 19, 1930s, the evolution of unit packaging, mass merchandising, self-service merchandising, starting in the 40s and 50s and going on and, and frozen food. A franchising, automation, Medicare, many, many factors that, that have caused this. It, 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 it took a long time to get this way now, uh, since, since the turn of the century, only it's here to stay, it seems like. Uh, growth, growth of disposables by kind. Here we have that one roll of toilet paper there, back in 1850, and it had no idea that it it would run to 400 by 1970.
growth of packaging disposable income and population, and you see how packaging is outrunning population considerably. Growth of supermarkets from, from a billion and a dollar, dollars worth of sales in 1935 to, uh, to over, over 30 billion in, in 1968, and it's just skyrocketing. It's just, it's just going on and on. Now, let's turn to the meaning of disposables. For the remaining time, let us consider briefly what this all means. If we can, it's not that easy. Obviously, affluence is a major factor. There's no such thing as uh, a, a nation that can produce disposables that is not affluent. Not only the rich, but a nation must also be consuming, mass consuming, to be able to afford uh, disposables. For example, compare the relative affluence of the USA and the USSR, and just take the, the automobiles in use per thousand capita. Uh, th that occurred in 1962. Uh, three, uh, three people per thousand in Russia had an automobile in 1962. Uh, compare that with three people per thousand in 1909 in the United States. Uh, that gives you a little feeling of, of, of how affluent we can get. Very few nations can produce and consume items in such quantities as to make them expendable. You know, the throwaway bit. For example, a ballpoint pen dropped in price. Those of you that are old enough remember the, the Reynolds pen for twelve fifty. I remember in grammar school looking at the the wealthy kids that, that had this strange looking thing in their pocket and wanting to get one as soon as I could. Well, it dropped from 12.50 here to, to less than 10 cents in 30 years of his, his existence, and it works better only in America. Or take the transistor radio. I designed one in 1954 that sold for about $80. That's a great big thing. It wouldn't fit in the pocket. Today, you can buy a more reliable one for, for a buck 99. This can only, of course, be possible here in America. Several thousand. Several thousand Honda automobiles, for example, that were imported into the U.S. a number of years ago were found to have faulty heaters and could not pass government standards. But rather than shipping them back, they were destroyed because it would cost more. This gives you a feeling of what, what, what we're doing here. The concept of expendability when applied, to, when applied to space rocket vehicles reveals that we can afford to throw away an entire, an entire engine that's, that's disposable. And a support system, 90% of the vehicle, worth many millions every time, just to, and we, just to say that little reusable tip up there, uh, <laughs> just like the Pentel pen here. Not unlike the Pentel pen, which incidentally was developed in the 1960s. In that both have consumable reusable elements, but unlike the space vehicle, the tip of the pen gets thrown out with the barrel. We know that when the ink is, com is exhausted. But what is the ink exhausted? We don't know. Our drawers are full of these things. We never give them up, right? <laughs> now compare that with the German, the German culture. This is the German Lamy here, which is guaranteed in the next century. Next century. Pens used to be considered a permanent possession. I remember, you know, not, I could hardly wait until graduating. You know, when I could get my pen, <laughs> right? Until felt tip pens and ball points came along. Think of your, your, think of your graduation present. Well, there's, there's no more status anymore. Disposables also mean increased unit costs. Now uh, here, compared to one pound container of salt on the left there, with that little small, nice little convenient disposable thing that we take on picnics, the salt costs 17 times as much. Most of all, disposables mean convenience. Here, the whole tablecloth and all the paper utensils and everything is being swept up for disposal in one swoop. Absolutely phenomenal, simple, isn't it? Speaking of food service, who can remember the, 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 the Sunday dinner, the traditional Sunday dinner? And I think Norman Rockwell shows it, shows it really best here, if you can see that well. 
think of that, that Sunday dinner, thousands of years of development says something about the institution of family eating. It had something to do with the culture of eating. It took a long time to develop that dinner. More than likely not, this scene is more familiar now. A quick food in the car, lots of fun, and healthy if you can balance the food you eat with a balanced diet. Yes, the faster one can eat, the sooner leisure starts and ends up too often like this, food a la carte down the, down the street. We're all familiar with this. Still other implications. Disposables are classless. They are used by the rich and poor alike, and thus, thus lack status. They, 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 they come from, from nowhere. They, they have no past, they have no present, and they have very much of a future. Compared to traditional chair shown here, and all its generations of meaning, with the classless one that is the expedient only to the economy today, and we're talking about we're talking about important concepts here, anthropologically speaking. It 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 isn't um, it isn't quite as simple as it as it may appear to adjust. What do you think of a disposable version of a wedding gown? Don't laugh, there really is such a thing. In fact, it comes in a box that includes instructions on how to make curtains out of it after the wedding. <laughs> you can laugh, but according to some anthropologists, interrupting the transmission of cultural traits from generation to generation may be quite harmful to our psychological well-being. Finally, where does all this end? The one common characteristic of all disposables, something I didn't talk about today, because we know all about it. I, don't, I didn't want to burden you with, with, with loads of statistics, ecological statistics. Waste, it's a monumental problem that strips us of our resources. It takes 850 acres to produce one Sunday edition of New York Times. And it takes 10 cents per copy to clean it up. That's a problem. That strips us of our resources and threatens our health and it's getting worse. Finally, I can't leave without noting what designers have done. They've exploited the communication value of waste that now even the dead can live on. Thank you.